This conference will now be recorded. Hey everyone, my name is Dean Schuster and thank you so much for welcoming me to Colorado Springs Tech Unconference. I'm pretty excited to be here and hope we'll have a, a good time together in this virtual environment. I've actually been to Colorado Springs a few times. Uh, I've gone up and uh, been to Garden of the Gods and uh, ran the Pikes Peak Marathon uh, several times. I didn't go this year, but I'm really hoping to come back next year. Maybe we can hang out. But for now, virtual will have to do. Uh, you can find me at Experience Dean on Twitter. Uh, I am a owner and partner in a company called True Matter. We do user experience, nothing else. We solve really complex digital product and service problems. And today, I'm going to be talking to you about what the Soviet space program taught me about digital product development. Totally not kidding. That's what we're talking about today. Now, it's amazing that something that happened a long time ago in the USSR could teach us anything at all about what we do as developers and makers of digital products, but it can. So I hope you have a good time in this little uh, delving back into history, but I promise we're going to relate it to what we do every day. Let's go back to 1968. Now, two tortoises made history, right? The Soviet space program launches these two little tortoises in this capsule, and it's going to go all the way around the moon and back and bring them back alive. They were the first Earthlings to fly around the moon and back. This mission was another first for the Soviets. They had a lot of firsts in the space race. The craft was called the Zond 5, cool name, right? And it did fly around the moon as planned, but it had a bunch of difficulty coming back down to Earth. Now, upon re-entry, uh, instead of landing in Kazakhstan, like it was supposed to, it landed in the Indian Ocean. And the CIA kind of knew that that was happening. Uh, and before the Russians could get to this capsule, right? Before it could be retrieved by the Soviets, we took pictures of it. And here it is. And when we took pictures, studied them, it confirmed what we had actually known now for years. Soviet technology was far, far behind our own. They were no threat to beat America to the moon. And three months later, Apollo 8 launches, circles the moon with people inside. Big difference from tortoises. And the Soviet Union throws up their hands, no moss, we can't do this. We abandon any attempt to reach the moon before the Americans. They had failed in the space race. Now, I swear when I first heard this, this totally sounded like digital product development to me. And I'm gonna try to prove that to you today because lots of digital products, they fail, right? To reach expectations, you know, there's ambitious goals. You wanna do this great thing, you're gonna push boundaries. You're gonna make sacrifices to reach the goal only to crash and burn. And the crash is usually a result of a broad series of failures. Now, there are uncanny similarities with the Soviet space program and the stuff we do every day to develop digital products, apps, sites, software, that sort of thing. Um, both are deeply based in high-tech engineering, software engineering, to be specific, right? Um, they both have a distinct design and human component. Both fields burst into the mainstream and captivated economies and imaginations. I mean, the internet itself basically sprang from the space race. They're that closely related. And both of these uh, different things involved making, involved the making of something, in this case, uh, a, a capsule that's gonna fly somewhere or a, a digital product we create, but they're part of a wider context, right? The space race is in the wider context of politics, propaganda, of countries, geopolitics. Development is hemmed in by the vagaries of how corporations work and their responsibilities and what the market will accept. There's bigger things at stake. So, you know, what went wrong for the USSR? I mean, they were doing great. In order to sort that out, I'm gonna have to give you a little bit of background. And for you millennials out there, Gen X, Gen Z, 
um, or Gen Y and Gen Z, I'm Gen X, right? But for you younger folks, let's do a little Space Race 101 because it's kind of ancient history for an awful lot of us right now. So we're gonna go back to the end of World War II, believe it or not. And the Soviets at the time were our allies and they rush on into Germany and they get there, they get to Berlin and they captured a bunch of German scientists and they captured a bunch of German technology. And this included the new V2 rocket. The Soviets immediately saw the potential of this rocket as a game changer for warfare, something that could help them quite a bit. And as they developed nuclear weapons of their own, they immediately began putting those two things together, nuclear weapons and rockets. So nuclear missiles start being used to forward Soviet interests, right? They never wanted again to be vulnerable like they'd been to invasion. They certainly wanted to stand strong as a world power. But they also believed they were in a systemic existential conflict with the West, right? They felt their system, communism, was superior and would inevitably overcome capitalism, democracy is embodied by the United States. So the United States on one side has this fleet of submarines and big bombers that could deliver nuclear weapons. The Soviets, because of all the technology they captured from Germany and all the scientists they, they got access to, they had the lead in rocket technology. So they had a ton of ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles. And that inventory of ICBMs helped them have the brute strength to back their interests and their goals. And what became the Cold War? started from this. It's an existential competition, right? By 1950, both sides have so many nuclear weapons. Uh, in the 1950s, they could destroy the other side many, 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 many times over. And this is where we get birth of the concept called MAD, Mutual Assured Destruction. There's two big superpowers and they're kind of arguing over the entire planet. Now, both wanted to avoid all out conflict because that could mean total annihilation, thermonuclear war. So the Soviet Union and America kind of settle into this conflict by other means, political, scientific, athletic, territorial, in terms of weaponry, and of course, in terms of space, right? The Soviet Union saw the potential for rockets to help them get into space, and they exploited this to the full, and they develop a fast moving space program. Space race is totally born because neither side wants the other to get the advantage in the space race and militarize space. That's a, a very real fear early on. How is that going to occur? What are we going to do? So both countries are very serious about it. it becomes a manic race. The game's afoot. Now, propaganda was very important in the Cold War. Uh, any showing of superiority became an end unto itself. The Soviet Union right, is already built upon sort of this substantial internal propaganda apparatus. Uh, uh, it develops a propaganda machine that aggressively publicizes all their achievements and things of this nature. This was really true of the space race where they wanted to show how amazing they were and how ahead of the United States they were because space had captured the imagination of the world. That's very important uh, to understand. And the holy grail of the space race is, of course, the moon, right? This is the main goal, the pinnacle achievement of humanity. We're going for it. And we knew the Soviets were as well. Sort of like the winner take all prize of the Cold War. Soviets strike first. In 1957, as we're all aware, they launch Sputnik 1. Uh, into orbit. And it is no exaggeration to say that the success of Sputnik 1 caused grave concern in America. Okay, just 12 years after World War II, we are suddenly vulnerable to spy satellites going right over our country. We're vulnerable, we felt, to the weaponization of space. These are really big and difficult issues of that day. The Soviets, of course, started a slew of firsts. I mean, they were first to dang near everything in the space race, right? First crewed space flight, first animals to orbit the Earth, first person in space, first person to orbit the Earth, 
first flyby of the moon, first photography on the dark side of the moon, first flyby of another planet, first woman in space, first spacewalk, first landing on another world. They had all of them. And that, that's not it, all right? They were amazing. And the interesting thing though, was that all of these firsts that the Soviet Union achieved, they came usually just, just before the Americans could pull it off, right? They got there really first and sometimes it was very close. Yet the United States did catch the Soviet Union, right? America is spurred on by JFK's impassioned 1962 speech. We choose to go to the moon, that sort of thing, right? And they methodically develop a substantial space program of their own, right? The Americans fall behind early and they don't get any of these firsts. They're never quite that far behind. And ultimately the methods of NASA and the Americans proved to be decisive. And in 1968, in Zond 5, it was already clear America had the superior program. And then, of course, comes 1965 uh, and courtesy of the onion, if they had been around at the time, surely this would have been the newspaper coverage. America gets to the moon first. See our flags right there. It's not the communist Soviet flag. So we did it. We got this holy grail. Why did it end up this way? I mean, why did it go the way it did? I mean, there's reasons for this and we can learn from the Soviets. Okay. So we did a little background. Let's dive into exactly what happened to make things go quite the way they did. Because um, the more I looked at what the Soviets did, the more I looked at their methods and the reasons why they did certain things they did, the more I saw parallels in what we as digital product developers do. And some of those parallels were a little concerning and, and they didn't feel very good uh, as I was thinking them through. And it's a cautionary tale for us. And I'm gonna look at just a, a couple of things. There's so many more parallels. We're just gonna hit on a few today. Um, now, we're gonna be helped along by a lot of these beautiful images from Soviet poster propaganda from the space race. Uh, this particular image uh, had the text, we were born to make the fairy tale come true. But really what happened here is that the Soviets were doing everything they could to put up the most basic thing they possibly could into space just for the purpose of getting there first. Speed was everything for them, but it didn't work out totally that way. So the USSR was seriously focused on being first. It's very difficult to overstate that. They threw everything into this effort. Uh, resources, they, they built whole cities of scientists. It was crazy. They bulldogged it. They bootstrapped it. Uh, they worked under unconscionable time pressure. So fast, things weren't even tested prior to launch. And we'll see more about that in a minute. Dates relentlessly drove the process, it drove goals, drove methods. Quality sublimated to the flash of these firsts. And one of the most important firsts for the Soviet program was the first spacewalk, right? 1965, Alexei Leonov left on the Voshkod 2 to orbit around the Earth. He performed humanity's first spacewalk. 12 minutes. Soviets were utterly determined to have the first spacewalk, and they cut some pretty serious corners to make it happen. The Voshkod 2 mission uh, was really a down and dirty retrofit of the Voshkod 1 rocket module. It was created expressly for the purpose of that spacewalk attempt, nothing else. It's kind of like, um, it's like a MacGyver operation, okay? They're like, they're getting the bubble gum out and you know, they're getting the tin foil out and they're trying to jerry-rig this thing, basically. Um, changes to the Voshkod 1 or the Voshkod 2 included uh, removal of the ejection seat. Uh, the crew module itself couldn't ever be open to space. 
because it was still using vacuum tube technology. That meant an untested inflatable exterior um, uh, uh, airlock had to be manufactured, put into place while they were up there, opened, inflated, all that sort of stuff. There was no provision for the crew uh, to escape uh, for launch or landing. Uh, the descent module itself was the same as the landing module. That was an interesting deal. And Leonov himself used a very experimental, very new spacesuit. Uh, it was, let's get this thing done. Let's go. And, um, you know, I, I still, I hold a lot of admiration for a guy like Leonov, who's probably like, whatever, you know, let's go, an amazing person. Um, but let's look at that real problem of that airlock, though because that's where the rubber, so to speak, hit the road. Now, when they're up in space and Leonov's gonna go outside of the spacecraft, keep in mind, this is an entirely new feature. It's untested, okay? And the atmosphere inside has to remain constant. So they need this sort of inflatable airlock. They gotta inflate it, they gotta open up, gotta manufacture the hatch, whatever, fine. When Leonov gets outside, okay, the spacesuit wasn't used to being in a vacuum very well. so because of the difference in pressure, it's expanding. And Leonov sort of expands out of his gloves and out of his boots, right? And when he's done with his spacewalk, he goes to get back into the Voshkod 2, and he's too big to get back into that, into that jury-rigged airlock. Uh-oh. He's a daring guy, if nothing else. So he decides, hmm, I gotta get smaller. So he vents oxygen from his suit, right? This makes him smaller. This also gives him decompression sickness right up there in space. He's got to do all this in under five minutes because they're about to get to the dark side of the earth and it's a major problem. He's running out of oxygen, all of this. Um, he heads back in, he's supposed to win feet first. He head back in head first because he's, he's losing it. He's got to get back in. He's got to turn around in that thing, get back in. They got to pull everything in. It's crazy. He's freaking out so much. He sweats so much that he fills his boots with sweat. Okay. This was a major problem. And, you know, in many of these areas, he almost died. Well, okay. It didn't really end there because on re entry, a uh, major malfunction, they crash into the Ural Mountains, barely survive. They are not picked up for two days. Uh, and the two pilots land off on the other dude, they end up uh, freezing in sub-zero temperature for two days, barely living through that. But they are first. So a price was paid. It's basically a miracle that this thing worked. And any one of these points could have been total failure and death. Uh, the airlock was just one of the problems, right? It's the whole story is quite shocking, actually. Um, you really should Google it, and I'll have a, a, a link put together when I uh, prepare the presentation. I'll, I'll prepare notes as well, and you can check that out. It's but you can Google it. It's fantastic stuff. Uh, by the way, future Voskhod missions were canceled immediately, deemed too risky and dangerous for the Soviets. That's saying something, because they did whatever. The comparison to digital products and quality is quite real. Can't you feel it just as I'm, as I'm speaking it? Haven't you worked on projects that felt distressingly similar? I certainly have in my career. Uh, before you deem it unfair, right, to compare modern software, right, with the Soviet space program, I think we have to consider the track record, don't we? As amazing and life-changing as everything we do has been over, you know, these past decades of uh, the commercial internet. The software development industry is not exactly known for rigorous, error-free products, is it? No. Even decades into the information revolution, digital products, as you know, still ship with swarms of bugs and substantial user experience flaws. Somehow, some way, we've gotten used to this. We actually even tolerate it. We tolerate it so much, we actually have a word for it now, right? MVP, minimum viable product. Now, no industry is perfect, okay? But we seem to have cornered the market on imperfection, have we not? We've embraced this notion so fully, we've given it a name. 
right? Now, there's good to minimum viable product uh, as a principle, and I realize that, definitely, right? Um, it's a response to sort of this industry-wide epidemic of overwrought solutions, expansive processes, individualized resources, delay, culture, things taking forever. The answer, build in digestible chunks, collaborate, release something that works that you can get out there and that, that you can then evolve. Okay, the, the principle is actually pretty good, but we've sacrificed something with the way we think about it. We've ingrained it in our culture differently, I think, from the theoretical basis from which it was created. Uh, correction was needed, right? But we have so much faith in this model, we didn't ask all the questions. What are all the things that we are sacrificing? Digital products, even though we've done MVP for a long time now, digital products are still shipping with errors, are they not? Sure they are. And those rampant user experience problems, they haven't gone away. Um, anyone listening to this uh, currently using one of those nifty folding phones? No? Maybe we're back right where we started, except we just sort of changed the way we got there. We've squandered something. I mean, MVB products are supposed to be built on the promise of evolution and change. Things will get better. Things will improve. Uh, things will proceed. But I'll tell you what, in my experience and the experience of my company, most MVP products shipped are rarely significantly altered after shipping. Most groups tend to move on to the next MVP. We've got to do better. Uh, yeah, we got to ship. We got to deliver incrementally, nimbly. It's a competitive world, right? I mean, we have no choice. Not a space race, but it's super competitive. But along the way, we, we've got to find a way to create higher level of quality in our digital products. It's the only way we're really going to achieve these things, especially if we're not returning to these products as much as we perhaps should. Uh, so I have a suggestion, being a UX person. Let's at least devote ourselves to better user experiences. Can't we at least focus on easier to use, more error-free, responsive, courteous, convenient products? We can do that at nearly any level of feature richness, right? The promise of high quality like that is worth the trouble. And it's actually worth the time uh, because usually the time is not that much more extended than the MVP. And even the money is not usually that much more extended than the MVP. And that reminds me an awful lot of how the Soviet Union and America danced around the space race. Um, and of course, you know, doing things this way will, will cost. Uh, I don't think there's any question about that. But it's truly, it's truly worth it. Uh, and it's worth it to bring in all the collaborative resources you need to flesh out a development team uh, to make it truly rounded with uh, resources like uh, user experience professionals or content professionals, uh, a greater focus on design or testing, uh, spending time with users, all those sorts of things. Uh, they definitely win out in the end. That brings me to Gemini 4. Three short months after this crazy, miraculous success of Oshkod 2, the Americans send up Gemini 4. Gemini technology was roundly superior in every way to the Voshkod. And it was way, way safer, right? Ed White, he uh, goes out and he's pictured here on the first American spacewalk. He spent 20 minutes outside. He's taken all sorts of video. He had to be ordered to come back in. He reluctantly comes back in. And just as he's about to get back into the capsule, he looks out one more time, in just total awe of where he is. And he says, this is the saddest moment of my life, having to go back in. That's a totally different experience from Leonov, isn't it? Totally different. Uh, not quite as, this is death defying, shall we say. So the Soviet reckless abandon, it pushes them to first, but they can't sustain the pace. I mean, Americans are not three months later, a substantial increase in quality. Three months is nothing, March to June. And Americans were also pouring 
resources in, they were also moving quickly, just moving differently. All right, let's move on. This image is called Through the Worlds and Ages. And I like to think of something called the Korolev effect. One person alone cannot save the day. I'd like you to meet the integral, a former colonel in the Red Army and chief designer of the Soviet space program, Sergei Korolev. This dude was thrown into the gulag by Stalin and left to die, but he knew rockets. And after World War II, there was such an intense focus on rockets, they brought him back out of the gulag, one of the very few scientists who got out. And he has this essential expertise. This dude is basically deified. He was everything in Soviet Russia. I mean, here's his stamp for crying out loud. Um, he is lionized, there's statues him everywhere. He was the driving force behind the Soviet space program. He was the man. No question about it. So Korolev, he knows rockets and he says, we can get to space in a big way. He's the guy who pushes the Soviet Union into space through the use of his rocket technology. And he leads the space program relentlessly. He's the guy who convinces Khrushchev that the space race is worth it for the propaganda value alone. And onward, onward, uh, the USSR goes. One person can change things. History is replete with examples of one person totally changing everything. Korolev is one of those people. He became utterly essential to the Soviet space program. He led all aspects of it, goals, planning, designs, missions, process, technology growth. If something happened, if anything happened, Korolev was behind it. He was amazing, by the way, and he was a singular he was in a singular position too, because a lot of the other scientists were quite frankly dead at the hands of Stalin. So not only was he a genius, he was relatively alone and that gave him tons of control and he exercised it right? to great effect. Unfortunately, there was a flaw in all of this because in 1966, sort of at the height of the fight in the space race, Korolev dies very suddenly. I mean, within days, sick, hospital, dead, just like that. And the Soviet space program, already barely keeping up with the Americans, was never the same again. And the thing about the first launch post Korolev, not too long after, because it's a big power vacuum, big power struggle, we should do this, we should do not people are fighting, uh, the, the whole program struggles without him because he so dominated it. They became even more reckless, trying to one-up each other. And they launched Soyuz 1, despite at least 200 design faults reported by engineers. They still put it up. It immediately encountered a series of failures that ended in an ignominious first for the Soviet Union, the first in-flight space fatality. One man was so pivotal that as soon as he was out, the program goes to pot. That's a fundamental flaw. Now, that unfortunately also made me think about the things we do. Because our industry is very personality driven, it's very talent driven, and talent moves in and out quickly. Um, we're not alone in this, right, as an industry, but it kind of feels that way. It's, just, it's hard to create great things, great systems, great software without you know, superstar players. We all work with people, maybe some of you all are the superstar themselves. And you are the single powerful driver behind a digital product you're creating. What happens when you, if you're that person, you leave? What happens if a person moves to another job? Lots of movement in our industry is retires, goes away, does something else, gets hit by lightning. Who knows? How much of our success is built on specific individuals and not broader things? And I wager to say in digital product development a lot. Uh, if the evidence of the things I've seen in my career is true, uh, teams, even whole organizations become dependent on superstars for good or ill, right? Particularly if those people are cantankerous and difficult. Uh, projects can start to get dependent on very specific domain knowledge. 
knowledge that maybe a few or one hold. Um, highly motivated political players can drive projects to ruin all by themselves. And this is essentially what happened to the Soviet space program. And we do see it a lot uh, with clients or internal teams, and it's astounding to still see it. And perhaps it's not so much the Soviet space program as the way humans are, right? Very possible, but it's definitely a striking parallel. Our job is to invest in teams and better collaboration. Definitely something that, that, that NASA did very well. Uh, a single person can make a difference, right? And you need these people, but you can't rely. So collaboration, of course, is the best way to make digital products. You need all sorts of different people uh, contributing to this mix, discussing, proving, changing, evolving things. You also need systems, systems that could out last and move beyond you. Uh, controls, components, widgets and code, right? Patterns for design or content. Um, these things move on as teammates change. Without this, without this sort of documentation, you're sort of at the mercy of the latest round of talent, what they know, what they do, right? Documenting everything is hugely important, even in evolutionary agile. It's important uh, for this reason. And of course, you need processes that simply don't need you. This image that you're seeing here, which I love, is uh, titled, Our Triumph in Space is the Hymn to the Soviet Country. Beautiful, beautiful uh, art, by the way, uh, from Soviet propaganda at the period. But let's talk about something uncomfortable as well. Reality. Reality being what you make it. Pravda. Pravda was a Soviet propaganda newspaper, right? It was a propaganda vehicle for the party. You've probably heard of it. Pravda means truth, right? Um, let's go back and see how Pravda dealt with something like the Zond 5 fiasco. Remember that mission that with the tortoises and you know we saw everything 1968 it barely succeeded, right? The capsules discovered by Americans and photographed, right? We're, we're very far behind. Well, Pravda labeled it a success and talked only about its earth shattering success. And the Soviet Union goes on to further that propaganda by establishing this beautiful uh, design stamp that proclaims total victory. In reality, Zon 5 was nothing more than a last gasp propaganda win. That's really all it was. It was nothing more. It was very hollow. Look when they issued this stamp. They issued this on five stamp in 1969 at about the time Neil Armstrong was stepping on the moon. Very, very different. But the Soviets were really good at propaganda. I mean, they were amazing at it. Just look at some of the images that we've been looking at. They really forwarded this notion of of mission and connection to the people. And of course, their system was very different, top-down, highly controlled, uh, sort of uh, highly institutionally uh, manipulative. I mean, certainly uh, the United States has problems, problems of its own in this area. It was just part of the institution in the Soviet Union. And so all of these wonderful posters are proclaiming Glory to the fatherland of heroes. Glory to the first woman cosmonaut. Glory to the Soviet people, pioneers of space, into space. And there's a whole host of these images. I will have a link to it in the notes. They are amazing. Beautiful, beautiful images. And they were used for one purpose uh, in the Soviet Union, and that was to drive reality. And that's the goal of all propaganda, right? The ability to say you are better, drive reality by force of will, motivate and manipulate a population to stay on board and be fully committed. It's a form of control. Humans are desiring to wrestle control out of chaos. And they do it by mm, having the truth be only tangentially related to the things you announce. Um, driving artificial timelines based on 
important anniversaries, our numbers, or US progress. You're driving events through propaganda by fear of your competition. Uh, announcements are uh, reinforcing the underlying system itself. The philosophy itself is a thing that's defended. Political concerns are superseding technology, safety, schedule, people. And quality is not a primary concern. It is, as I like to call it, a beast unto itself. The machine itself becomes the thing that matters. The message is more important than anything. And certainly both the US and USSR were deeply concerned about propaganda hits because it affected world opinion, it changed things. The need to control the narrative, the narrative itself was driving how the space race was working, particularly on the Soviet side. It drove paranoid spy culture for crying out loud. Now, this makes me think of digital product narratives which I unfortunately see all the time. And I'm thinking you can probably see them as well. Propaganda is not the exclusive province of countries, is it? Organizations play in this sandbox, right? Product launch decisions are timed to competitors' launch decisions, to trade shows, to artificial deadlines. Are they not? Sure. Announcements are intended to procure deals, sales, or to placate investors. There are tons of exaggerated claims about incremental product updates. We're over-promising features without consulting project teams or counting the costs. How many of you experienced that? There's paranoiac secrecy. We're awash in propaganda. Just like in the Soviet Union though, it's, it's all veneer. It's all veneer, and particularly development teams just know this to be true. Propaganda is certainly a problem for us, and the only way we can think to combat it, right, is to do some of the things we've seen that are the converse of what the Soviet Union was doing, right? Move quickly, but launch only when quality is appropriate. Seems reasonable, right? Be honest about your product and capabilities. If it's great, the market's going to accept it. It will. Reduce features. Do less. Deliver something smaller but better. Isn't that a good idea? I think so. And then share freely with others. These are the ways that you combat this problem, at least in digital product development. OK, so let me conclude a little bit with some things to think about based on what we've talked about today. Engineers uh, drove the innovation that pushed us in the space. And they learned a lot of lessons along the way. And a lot of these lessons live with us today in the processes of software development. And they can help us today as we develop software and apps and advanced functionality. Uh, we need to listen to that and it's good to research the past in this way not to just look at the failures of a system like the soviet union but to the things it did well but also to the successes of the alternate path because your model drives your methods right how you think about something how you conceive of what you're doing determines what you make how you make it and how you sell it so Soviet goals, right, were primarily centered around fast propaganda wins. And they, they achieved that, did they not? Yeah, they sure did, for a time. America's goals at the time were broader, and they achieved success more broadly. So if you just want to get to the next release, you can do that. If you want to build something less feature intense, but higher quality that will last, you can also do that. It's a matter of what you're setting out to do. Your starting point matters. Uh, you can always fail, of course. Um, it's been said uh, many times that success has many fathers, but failure is an orphan. I think students of the space program, uh, Soviet space program, and of digital product development, they know that's not true. Failure has many fathers. Success is just elusive, you know. Um, think of your last digital product failure. Did just one thing cause it to fail? No. 
everything probably went to hell in a handbasket all at the same time. And that's a lot of, of what happened in terms of cascading failures with the, the Soviet approach, or you think Vostok 2, things like that, Soyuz 1. Um, we can certainly get better at this. Uh, we can do better by paying attention to all this. And that's encouraging. Um, we can learn from the past. You know, we can learn a great deal from the space race and how we uh, comport ourselves today. Um, it's not, and really, if, I, if I'm thinking of the Soviets' failures, it's, this is not some esoteric crazy thing. This is real evidence about how certain ways of going about things affect outcomes. It's not just a bunch of developers complaining uh, that, you know, leaders or whatever, they don't do things right. I mean, this is evidence. This is, you know, uh, clear process failures. And conversely, there's clear process successes that we can look at. And that's important for us to learn and adapt from. It's important for leaders. It's important uh, for directors. It's important for developers. And it's important for all those other people that work with them. I will offer you, since I, I told you earlier I'm a marathon runner, I'm going to offer you my marathon rule. You are almost always doing better than you think. Americans were paranoid right up into the moon landing that the Soviets were going to beat us and we were terrible. But the Zond 5 story shows us that fear was not totally warranted. We were doing way better, way better than we thought. The race was not a series of sprints, as the Soviets um, really felt they were, I think. It was more of a long distance race, more of a marathon. And, and the United States, through NASA, was running a marathon of sorts. So this approach, which I say is more methodical and more measured in its speed, uh, really did that. And you can look to NASA. When you really need encouragement, look to NASA, which is just a really wonderful story all the way through. Because you think it's impossible sometimes, I'm sure, because I do, to hit aggressive development deadlines while simultaneously creating high quality user love prog products, right, that have lots of quality. You think that's impossible? We put a man on the moon. It wasn't perfect. We did it fast. We invented along the way. We figured it out along the way. We invented processes along the way, solutions to novel problems. We did it still with professional excellence. And by the way, marked attention to safety, even though we had our dips as well. We were really focused on doing it right, and it showed. So if we beat the hyper-competitive, less careful Soviets to the punch, and that wasn't impossible, it's not impossible for you. For us, it was simply extraordinary, which it will be for you as you succeed. The point is you two can totally do this. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Uh, again, my name is Dean. Here's all my contact information. This whole talk came out of a, a blog post uh, after a bunch of research. And you can check out that post or uh, contact me uh, through Twitter or whatever. Find me any way you like. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, talking with you. Thank you so much for inviting me to your conference. I hope someday, perhaps, we could even meet in person. Until then, uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen and say farewell.